Americans are generous. Why? What is that impulse to give? Where does that come from? So let's start with a very common level of thinking around charitable giving that I call meet the need. And, you know, we want to help, right? So when we give from this state of consciousness, our thinking goes something like this. I have capacity, you have need. This is going to be a subtraction from me, but it's going to be an addition to you. It might even be a sacrifice for me, but it's going to be a blessing to you. My loss, your gain. Does that sound familiar? Yes, we've all thought it, we've all experienced it. But think about it for a second. Me, you. Loss, gain. A subtraction, addition, right? The whole way of thinking sets up a duality. I have capacity, you have need. It can actually contribute to a kind of power differential between the giver and the receiver. And when taken to its logical conclusion, the meet the need level of thinking around charitable giving can actually end up dividing us at a heart level. But there is another state of consciousness around charitable giving that's at play here. One that creates no duality, one that sets up no divisions between us. It, it wells up from this deep desire in each and every one of us to belong to something, right? To be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And when we give from the we belong to one another state of consciousness, our thinking goes something like this. I'm going to make this gift because there but for the grace of God go I, brother. We're in this together. But for the smallest turn of luck, opportunity, chance, I could be you, you could be me. And so what happens to me matters to you, and what happens to you matters to me because we actually belong to one another. So I'm going to make the gift. Now, I want to tell you it's the exact same gift, right? It's the exact same money, but it's an entirely different interior experience. When we give from this state of mind, it is sheer joy and a sense of freedom like I have never seen in any other context. I am the president of the Community Foundation for Northern Virginia, so philanthropy is my business. And um, a couple of years ago, we had a board member who made a very generous gift to the Community Foundation, and I was thanking him. And our conversation extended beyond um, the gift, and we were talking about charitable giving in general. And, you know, he's this really animated guy, and um, he was gesticulating away, and he, he was in a great mood talking about this. And he said, you know, I know this is going to sound completely crazy. It sounds crazy to me as it's leaving my lips, but I don't even feel like I own it. So might as well make it official and just give it to you. And I thought, good heavens, what is that interior experience? What's going on there, you know? He earned every dime the hard way, and yet his sense of connection somehow extended even beyond the interpersonal to include the very things that he owned. Now, if that isn't personal freedom, I don't know what is. It's joy and it's freedom. And you know, our culture here doesn't really nurture that well. It doesn't. But there are places in the world that does, other places in our country, I'm sure, and other places in the world. And this lesson was really brought home for me about nine years ago when our daughter, Emma, who is 25 years old today, was 16. And she went on a teen service trip to uh, Southeast Asia, and they visited Thailand and Cambodia. And being the classic American parents that Bob and I are, you know, we thought, okay, our daughter's going to go off to this place, and she is going to come back with a renewed sense of gratitude for everything she has been given. This is going to be her big takeaway, right? Yeah, you're laughing already. You see where this is going. <laughs> so she goes off and, uh, for a month and comes back, and sure enough, you know, there are comments aplenty about the water wasn't um, really reliable, the food was a little sketchy, you know, uh, things not, weren't comfortable. Okay, parental box check, you know, she learned this was her big takeaway. It was a takeaway, but it wasn't her big one. That took two more weeks to come out. And we were at dinner two weeks later, and she said, you know, I've been thinking about something that had never even occurred to me before I went. And 
She said, Americans are lonely. They seem lonely to me. She said, we have all these things, but we, outside of our families, don't really seem to have each other. But it's the exact opposite in Thailand and Cambodia. They hardly have anything. It's subsistence farming where we were. But they have each other. And so as a result, they seem very, very happy. They're happier. So would you and Daddy think about moving to Thailand? I, I saw lots of expats there, and I want to live there. Yes, that was her takeaway, you know? And no, we didn't move to Thailand. But that was her takeaway because we hunger for this. We need this, and we can't find it here always. But she had it there. So what is happening closer to home? There is an organization called Giving USA, and they do an annual survey of all philanthropic giving in the United States. And last year, they reported that Americans gave away $410 billion in private philanthropy, broke the $400 billion mark for the first time. I mean, it's remarkable. We are the most generous people on the planet, hands down. It's not even close. And in May of this year, Cigna, the health insurance company, came out with a study that said almost one half of Americans self-report as feeling lonely either all of the time or most of the time. Wow. Emma's hunch nine years ago was, turns out to be right. Americans are generous. Americans are lonely. Is all that giving really about meeting someone else's need? I, I don't think so. I think that's a story we tell ourselves. I think the more likely explanation is a lot of that giving is about meeting our own need to be a part of something bigger, to belong, to connect in meaningful ways with one another, and to really be in true community with each other. So if the culture here doesn't nurture this, and we have to find it for ourselves, what if we get more strategic with our philanthropic giving? What if the next time we are inclined to give a gift, we join a giving circle, where people get to connect personally and professionally with one another, where they give at affordable levels to the causes that they care about, and pool their philanthropic giving for greater impact? It's a powerful model of collective philanthropy. Or what if we volunteer? Now, this is obvious, but what if we chose to volunteer somewhere where the people we will be interacting with, we have somehow otherized? And what comes to mind is a local elected official here who I heard a few years ago talk about an experience he had just had at a homeless shelter. And he decided to volunteer for the night with FACET's hypothermia initiative, you know, in one of the churches during the winter months. And so he went in for the night, and he was chatting up one of the women that had come into, um, come into the shelter for the night to get out of the cold. And these were his words. He said, as she was telling me her story, the scales fell from my eyes. And the thought occurred to me for the first time, oh my goodness, that could be me. We think volunteering is a sacrifice. It's a gift. And another, another way for us to develop a sense of belonging and connectedness is to, is to use our curious mind to get there, right? To come to something like this with friends, and then afterwards go out to dinner and download on what your big takeaway is and decide what your action item is going to be. The point being, we can use our philanthropy, we can use our volunteerism, we can use our curious minds to develop a deeper sense of connection and belonging. Now that brings me to the theme of tonight's event, legacy. Not in the philanthropic sense, but in the bigger banner sense, the Iroquois Nation's idea, this seven generations principle, that we should take no action today without considering its impact on people that will be born over the next seven generations. Only the second I read that, the thought occurred to me, they don't mean seven. I know they said seven, but that's a random number. I don't think they mean seven times 15 years or however we define the length of a generation. I don't think they mean a long time. I don't think the phrase seven generations has anything to do with time. Instead, 
I think it's a powerful juxtaposition of words that is intended to evoke in us a state of consciousness. A we belong to one another state of consciousness right now, in the here and now, in this second, where time just cuts out. And we're all duality. Every single thing that divides us just dissolves. And what is left is nothing more and nothing less than a kind of remembering, right? A kind of homecoming to the idea that we belong to one another. And from that state of consciousness, we can take no action, we can form no thought, we can speak no word, that doesn't consider our shared humanity across time and space, whether it's seven or 17 generations from now. And as for today, it is entirely possible to connect more, to belong more, the culture notwithstanding, and to use this great, big, mysterious, generous American heart to help us get there. Thank you.